So we went from thinking we had a perfectly healthy baby getting ready to go home to four hours later, what 25% chance to live, not knowing if she's going to make it through the night. And it's just the amount of emotions that go through are just incredible. You're from one high to a low that quick. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am not Anna Jaworski. I am Anna's husband, Frank, and I'm the guest host for Heart Dad Sundays in February of 2023. Anna and I have an adult child with a single ventricle heart, and that's why I'm the guest host of this program. Today's show is titled, A Heart Like Mine? Dan is father to Kaylee Rodenbaugh, who was born on June 26, 2009, at St. Luke's Hospital in Lee's Summit, Missouri. Kaylee is his fourth daughter, but the first one with a heart condition. Dan Rodenbaugh is 52 years of age, and he's been happily married to Marie for 27 years. He was born with a heart defect and was treated at Children's Mercy Hospital until he was 18 years old. He had a heart murmur, which led to the discovery of his heart condition. Regardless, he did sports, including football, although he tired easier than other athletes his age. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dan Rodenbaugh. Thanks for having me on the show, Craig. Dan, in the opening, we learned that you had a heart condition. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. I was born with subvalvular aortic stenosis, which is known as subaortic stenosis for short. My ventricle wall was thicker than normal, which created an obstruction as the blood moved through the aortic valve. I was diagnosed in infancy with a heart murmur, which slowly got louder as I grew older. I was treated at Children's Mercy Hospital from birth until I was about 18 years of age. And at that time, the doctor said that I'd pretty much grown out of my condition. I played sports, was fairly active when I was younger. I just remember tiring out much easier than other kids. For example, after football practice, I'd cleat the whole drive home. And the doctors would just say, my body would tell me when I had enough. After I was 18, I haven't received treatment for my heart anymore. Yeah. It's something that I took the doctors at the words that I grew out of and didn't need to receive treatment. Dan, that's fascinating. I know that I have experienced in my professional life, I'm a nurse anesthetist. I give anesthesia for surgery, and I've seen a lot of critical care patients and emergency department patients. I know that subaortic stenosis can be very dangerous depending on the degree. So you must have been lucky and hit a sweet spot where it didn't require intervention and you were able to, with just managing your activity level, keep it from causing you any harm. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't really have any procedures through my young childhood. I did have two catheter procedures where they went in and observed to make sure everything was progressing like they should. Didn't really create any restrictions in my life. I'm kind of a sick child. I just had a lot of allergic reactions to things. And then on top of that with my heart defect, it just made for a rough childhood there and put a lot of extra pressures on my mom so I can see. Now with Kaylee, kind of what she went through as we were growing up and kind of rocked there for a little bit. That's an interesting fact that you were the one in the middle. So you've had to experience being a child with a heart problem and the parent of a child with a heart problem. Right. Then in the 70s, doctors didn't know as much about congenital heart defects or CHDs as they do now. You said you had some procedures, but they were just diagnostic procedures to try to look at your congenital heart condition. They ever tried to repair it. Is that correct? Correct. They never tried to repair it. My experience was going through the hospitals were just mainly EKG, heart appointments twice a year, once a year. I did have two cath procedures that we spoke of just to make sure the stenosis wasn't changing, that it wasn't getting any worse, that it wasn't creating more of a blockage. But that's my biggest issue was, is that blood flowed down. It, it created that, that obstacle that the blood had to try to flow around. And that was their biggest concern to make sure that it wasn't creating more of a blockage. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the ways in which you're quite lucky, and I'm sure you've heard this, is that many people who have subaortic stenosis don't find out until they have a catastrophic event. Either they have what seems like a heart attack or actually have a full arrest because the subaortic stenosis blocks all the flow out of the ventricle. So the fact that you were found as an infant, you can approach it gingerly and take it one step at a time. I'm sure that's very important to your survival. 
Oh, absolutely. The doctors just being able to catch all that. I was a sick kid. And so I was already at Children's Mercy Corps, other things with allergies to pretty much everything, alerts to everything. And so just in that time frame, picking up on the heart mama and being able to treat me for that, it's just a miracle that we can do things and pay attention. The heart community has grown so much since from the seventies to where we are now. And just with Kaylee and just all the technology and everything they could do, it's amazing. Absolutely. Now you told us that your doctors told you that you outgrew your heart condition. When did you realize that wasn't actually true? Well, like I said, I thought I outgrew it, but that's what I was told until I went and tried to join the Marines. During that physical, I actually went to Kansas City and stayed overnight, had a physical and my heart murmur showed up loud and clear. The first doctor came in and he listened and he was just like, let me get somebody else to come in here and listen. And one after another, two or three different people came in and they just said, with your condition, we're not going to let you into the military. And that's where I realized that, hey, maybe I didn't outgrow it. I didn't have any treatments since I left Children's Mercy, but there was still something there. And if you listen to my heart today, I still have a heart murmur, you know, and that's 30 four years after I left Children's Mercy. And so it just made me realize that I need to be cautious of how I live my life, how I eat. After Kaylee was born, I did go in and have a screening, a check for plaque in my arteries, and have my heart checked and everything turned out well. And then I did it again two years ago, just to make sure that there's nothing that's going to come back or that's affected from my condition that I had when I was a child and everything so far still says everything's good. That's really good. Now, when you presented for your physical, did you tell them that you had a history of subaortic stenosis or whether they find it just by the murmur and then they found out about your history? They found it just by the murmur and then started asking questions. Like that I was 19 years old, 20 years old, two years ago, Children's Mercy told me, hey. You don't have a condition anymore. You outgrew it. So I didn't think anything about it. I right. didn't tell them ahead of time saying, hey, I have this condition from one of the child because I thought it was all said and done. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Before the break, we were talking about your medical history. Now let's focus on your family. In the opening, we learned that you have four daughters. Was your wife considered a high-risk pregnancy since you had a history? of congenital heart defects? Well, Kaylee was our fourth pregnancy and she was eight years after our previous. She was born in 2009 and her other youngest daughter was born in 2001. So all three of her other children's pregnancies were normal, except one. Cassandra arrived six weeks early and we had some medical issues from that. Nothing heart related. It was mainly my wife was sick at the time and just happened to be that they had to take her early to help Marie get better, but nothing heart related. So none of the doctors were concerned with heart defects because one, I told them I outgrew it when I approached the ball did and haven't had any follow up with it. And they didn't seem to be concerned with it. When Marie was pregnant with Kaylee, it was fairly normal. We didn't have any issues through the whole time frame. We had the normal ultrasounds. She did have a 
ultrasound at two weeks before Kaylee was born, just to check on the growth of the baby because Kennedy was born early or last pregnancy. They just wanted to make sure everything looked good. And when they did that ultrasound, they even noted that all four heart chambers were viewed and that there weren't any issues with the child. So we didn't know of the heart condition at all until two days after she was born. Marie was never in a high risk pregnancy. There was never any concerns from the doctor. All four heart chambers are viewed. And so once all this hit two days after she was born, we were in shock. So because the doctors told you there was no risk or no unusual risk, you weren't especially concerned yourself. You took their word and went from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. We even went back to the ultrasound doctors and said, Hey, you guys did this ultrasound. It shows all four heart chambers viewed and they didn't really know what to say. They said that they were going to have to have more training with their ultrasound techs. And sometimes I feel, you know, those ultrasound techs that I don't know if they don't look at everything as seriously as they should. By the time you get past the picture of the baby and making sure that all the boxes are checked because Kaylee didn't have four heart chambers, but it was sure checked. That reminds me on a different topic medically. My wife's grandmother went into the hospital because she had gallbladder problems and they did surgery to remove her gallbladder and there was no gallbladder. There was just the bile duct coming out of the liver, went straight to the intestines. That's unusual to have that. But if you look back at her ultrasound report for the surgery, it said gallbladder poorly visualized. And yes, I would say very poorly since it wasn't there. In the same respect, your daughter did not have four chambers. And yes, at the very least, I hope it made those techs very aware and alert in the future to do more than just check the boxes, as you say. Yeah, like when Kaylee was transferred to Children's Mercy, the first doctor we saw there was puzzled that we had no clue what was going on. Because she even saw that Kaylee had a ultrasound two weeks ago. And she said, how can you not be aware of this? And it was a shock to them that we didn't know. Right. Because trust me, if we knew, we would have had a different plan going into this. Of course. Of course she would have. And again, we have a parallel with our child, with our heart warrior. And that is that she wasn't diagnosed until eight weeks of age. We knew there were problems. We weren't sure what it was. She was diagnosed. She was taken down to San Antonio about two and a half, three hours away. And then. I worked with her there. And one of the first things one of the nurses there said to us was, didn't they notice the cardiomegaly, the increased size of the heart silhouette on the initial x-ray? And I said, they didn't do any x-rays when she was born. And he was very puzzled because he said, every baby that's born in their hospital has a chest x-ray. And it's a pretty simple and relatively inexpensive thing. So I understand why they're done. And so sometimes things get missed and it's a little frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So he didn't mean you. O2 check, that wasn't a standard procedure when Kaylee was born. Right. They didn't check the O2. Now it's a standard procedure, very minimal cost. And that right there would have shown that, hey, there was an issue instead of us finding out after she had already gotten so sick. So tell us about Kaylee and her heart condition. Kaylee was born in 2009 and she was diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So she's single vertical. She also has the LPA that's narrow and she's mitotresia in an aortic atresia. We had no knowledge that anything was wrong with her. Like I said before, this was all a shock. She was born on a Friday afternoon and everything was going great. Pediatrician came in, did her check up on her. The cardiologist that made the rounds in the hospital came in and said, I can hear a slight murmur and I think you guys ought to have it followed up on after you leave the hospital with your normal pediatrician. And we didn't think anything of it because we were told by the doctors that, hey, there's nothing there. So Kaylee was discharged from the hospital and I'd pulled the car up to front of the hospital to get ready to leave. I was loading the car seats and everything. And Marie wanted to feed Kaylee before we left because we lived about an hour away from the hospital and she's like, I want to feed her before we leave. And she just started changing. She started crying. She wouldn't eat. She started making grunting sounds like she was gasping for air. We already checked out of the hospital, the baby and Marie. And I was like, I'm going to grab the thermometer. It felt cold. And I grabbed the thermometer off the wall and her temperature was 94 degrees. Wow. So we. Took her down to the NICU. Every one of our children, we had 
at a hospital that had a NICU in it just for this reason. Just in case there was an issue with one of our babies, we wanted somewhere that had something that could react to it quickly. So we took her down to the NICU and they asked how long she'd been like that. And it's just in the last few minutes, she was decompensating. Her body was shutting down. And so they took her, stabilized her, gave her the medicine to open her PDA back up so she can start giving blood back to a body and called in the transport to Children's Mercy. And once we got to Children's Mercy, we met the doctors and they gave her that first night a 25% chance to live. So we went from thinking we had a perfectly healthy baby getting ready to go home to four hours later, we're 25% chance to live, not knowing if she's going to make it through the night. And it's just the amount of emotions that go through are just incredible. You're from one high to a low that quick. And so we were checked into Children's Mercy and she had become super sick. Her body was so acidotic since her organs were going into organ failure that it took her about two weeks to recover from that incident before they felt comfortable with to do her first surgery. So she didn't have her first surgery until July 15th. So it was almost three weeks after she was born when she had her first surgery, the Norwood. And that was performed by Dr. Locke on their children's mercy. And everything went great. The first night, everything went great. They came in the next morning and they closed her chest up, which is very quick. For the little baby like that, within 12 hours, your test is already closed out. And so everything was great and you were going good. And she stayed in the hospital for a while and we were discharged to come home. And once we were home, it was good, but she started to fail again. And it just seemed every day we had to turn up the oxygen to keep her sats up. And finally, we had to have her on so much oxygen to keep her stats up that we knew something was wrong. And at the time, we had a home health nurse that came in visited, the day and we said, listen to her, something's not right. In the middle of the night, she ran out of oxygen. By the time I got up and changed the bottle, she was batting at 25%. Wow. And that was just within 45 seconds to a minute. By the time I just changed the bottle that quick, her stats dropped that far. So the nurse listened to her and said, yeah, you guys need to take her in. And so we did. And so the nurse, you couldn't find anything wrong with her and they did blood tests. They did anything and everything. And the doctor finally said, we're going to have to open her up and find out what's going on. And since we're going to do that, let's go ahead and do her glen at that time. And so they did her glen on October 12th. She was about three months old. And when they did her glen, they opened her up. She had an infection around the BT shunt where it joined into her pulmonary artery and the body had built a wall around it. None of that infection was showing up in her blood anywhere. And so the doctor was amazed. He said, he'd never seen anything like that. And he said, she's lucky that the body did walk off or else she'd have been a whole lot thicker. And so they did the glen. Everything went well, no issues, no side effects. We did have to go back in the hospital just for a bleak time afterward. It's been pretty quiet. She had her Fontaine about four years old on July of 2013. Everything went well there. She's like this rock star patient that just can heal. Totally different than as I get older, it seems like it takes me forever to get over a cold and here she is. Pulling through open heart surgery and ready to go home. And it's just amazing. Our daughter Hope also has HOHS and uh, with some differences in timing, a lot of the steps that she went through sound very much like what you went through with Kaylee. Yeah. Yeah. She's done pretty well. Her heart muscle doesn't have as much strength as they'd like it to have. Yeah. So they've been talking different things that, hey, we're probably looking at maybe putting a pacemaker in. Transplant been discussed a couple times. It scares me to death right now. Cause that was just a word that we had never thought of for a little bit. We thought everything was going great. And all of a sudden the doctors start talking about transplant and you're like, wait a minute, how'd we get from here to here? But that's possibly down the road, but she just didn't do very well in her stress test. And so they're looking at ways to give her heart more beating power. Right. 
but right now they're just monitoring our heart. They're monitoring a label. So Kaylee also has some neurodivergent, which is not uncommon with children with heart defect. So she has ADHD right now. And so we're learning to treat that and help her find different ways to learn in different ways that affects her brain that works with her system. That's something that we're really trying to learn on how Kaylee needs to learn what works best for her and her condition. The other part of that is we became friends with Nick and Jenny Busta. They became mentors to Kaylee. And so we really leaned on them quite a bit because they've been through all this. Jenny's 36, 37 years old. So we talked to them a lot, probably daily, just to more and give Kaylee some mentors to look up to the people that have the same issue as she does. Yeah. And two, to give less of parent drink, to be able to talk to somebody that's been through this and know what to expect. Right. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. In the last segment, Dan, we learned that Kaylee was born with a heart condition. Have you had any genetic testing to see if the heart condition was inherited? That's a great question. And I have not had any testing done, but I've talked about it a lot. Because I truly believe there's a connection there. I truly believe it. And it'd be interesting to see if it was true. And I'll be honest with you. And I'll probably get upset here and there a little bit, but. There was a while that I felt guilty. I felt really guilty because I blamed me for her heart condition. And it was tough. Yeah. It was real tough. I can only imagine what that felt like, but I, I see what you're saying. Anytime there's anything like that that could have come from you, you think, how could I have prevented this? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you look at it, we had three healthy pregnancies before. Right. Kaylee was ever born. And You're doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. But still, it's in the back of your mind. It truly is. So you haven't had a genetic test? No, I haven't. And it's something that we probably ought to look to just going forward for my other daughters and Kaylee when they start their family, yeah. just to have that knowledge available to them. It's something that we probably will be looking into doing. Dan, you have three grown daughters. What advice would you give them regarding planning for their own family? Well, pray. I just want them to have as much information as possible. My mother got sick when I consider her was still pretty young. She was diagnosed with dementia at age 50. And so I feel that I have a lot of questions about my health and my family health that I didn't get from her. She just started losing her memory. And so I want my children to have all that knowledge, to be able to challenge the doctors if needed, or to be able to ask questions to the doctor. Because for example, Marie was Kaylee's biggest advocate at the hospital. She never left. She made sure that she was there for every single doctor's rounds to be involved in the conversation. She challenged the, this is what we do for every case theory to let's look at it on a case by case basis to make sure that's right for Kaylee. For example, they wanted to put a G-tube in and she fought for them to do a swallow test. Did before they even got to that 
point and she won. I remember the day she called me and she, the doctor is screaming at me in the hallway, telling me that this is what they do every single child and this is what they're going to do. And she said, I had to stand up and fight for it. And Kaylee didn't need a G2. And so we didn't go there, but I just want my children to have that knowledge. I want them to be able to ask the right questions at the doctor's visit and make sure that proper tests are being done. And I think it kind of goes back to that genetic testing, whether I need to get it done or not. I think I do. Because it's going to give them that knowledge. Is this going to show up in the future? Is it genetic that something that can be carried through them, even though it might not show up on them right now? And so I just want them to have knowledge to be able to make good decisions, be able to make right decisions when they do start their family, when they do start having children. I just want them to learn everything that we've done and basically Kaylee, I want them to be able to learn from it. Yeah, and that's great. It sounds like your wife, by being a strong advocate, has helped to inspire you to be a strong advocate too. Absolutely. Absolutely. She was in the hospital for probably six months total. If it wasn't for me being there, there would have been so many things that would have a different outcome. We have to be our biggest advocate for our children, no matter what age they are, whether they're 20, 25, or an infant. That's what we're here for is to make sure that they're successful. That's great. Now you have two generations in your family, yourself and your daughter, that have been affected by congenital heart defects. So if you talk to up couples who are planning a family and they have a history of congenital heart conditions, what sort of advice would you give to them? I would just want to make sure they have all the information available. Let them know the family history to help decide if they would fall into those high risk categories. We didn't have any knowledge of issues with Kaylee and we had a rough few months on whether she was going to mind or not. And that's hard on a marriage. It's hard on a couple and something that we learned through this process is we have to make decisions together as a couple. We had to be prepared and find ways to support each other with the ups and downs of everything happening. One of us could be having a bad week while the other one was withdrawal and vice versa. We had to lean on each other to ensure that one person wasn't upset with the decision that was being made. And along with that, I think they have to find other people to build relationships that have experience or have that same types of experiences that have been through certain medical conditions. Then like Nick and Jenny, we met Jenny by searching on the internet, what is HLHS and her name popped up and her phone number was listed right there. So we called her. Kaylee was three months old. We had no clue, no clue at all. But here was a person that, man, can answer our question that we know, hey, there's a chance of life. We didn't know how long Kaylee would live. We knew nothing. And so finding somebody to be able to answer that question. And 13 years later, we talked to them every day. They're still in our lives. They're still giving us guidance. They're still giving us mentorship. So finding a great that can support you, that can be part of your life and answer questions and just help you make those good educated decisions. Wow, Dan, it sounds to me like you have things wired up right. You and your wife are a good team. As advocates, you have support from people who know what it's like to go through it and you are ready for anything. I would hope to think so. Dan, thanks for coming on the program today. Thanks for having me, Craig, and I really appreciate it. It's good to talk to you. It's good to meet you in this way, Dan. That concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please tune in tomorrow to hear another Medical Monday episode for Heart Month 2023. Have a great day. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time, wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.